Good morning. Welcome to Rock of Ages. My name is Doug. I'm one of the elders. First of all, thanks everyone for being flexible. Uh, we decided to not have an in-person worship service this Sunday just due to the inclement weather. I could show you uh, my backyard right now. It's got quite a bit of snow and I'm expecting there'll be more, but we can still worship uh, through this video. Um, I just want to explain a little bit about what's going to be happening in the service today. You're going to be hearing uh, two different um, people bring a bit of a teaching message. First of all, you're going to hear from my father, Lloyd Nya, who's going to talk a little bit about the beginnings of Rock of Ages. If you've been participating in our 40 days of prayer, uh, you may have already seen part of this, um, but um, it, it's still, there's lots of good information in there. And then you're also going to be hearing from Dr. David Viem, uh, the president of the Lutheran Brethren Seminary, and he's going to be talking uh, a little bit more specifically about prayer. And maybe this is just a good um, opportunity to promote our 40 days of prayer. We've currently had our first seven days of the 40 days, and there's been some people showing up in person to the church. And so that's one way you can participate. I know uh, many of you are getting a daily email from our secretary, Kalina Claussen, explaining the prayer focus for that day. If you're following our Instagram account, it's Rock of Ages SK, one word. Search for that on Instagram. There's also posts daily um, with the prayer focus for that day. And then, of course, our uh, church Facebook group that um, many of you, I think there's almost 400 now that are members of that, have been um, following. So that also has posts every day for the 40 days of prayer. And um, this particular service, this Sunday, because it's a video service again, um, some of you will probably also be watching in our YouTube um, Rock of Ages SK account as well. So there's many different ways that you can participate in the 40 days of prayer. And I hope, I hope that you are finding a way to spend some time um, praying and listening to what God is telling you about uh, our church and sort of the future direction of our church. Just before uh, my father brings the me teaching message about the history of the church, uh, you'll see some announcements and some PowerPoint slides. Just have a look at those. It kind of explains what's happening this week in our church. And again, our hope is that we will be uh, resuming our in-person worship next Sunday again. So thanks for joining us this morning. Um, enjoy the messages. And at the end of Pastor Viam's message, he will be concluding our service with a word of prayer. Take care. My name is Lloyd Nyo, and I'm going to try to give you a brief history of Rock of Ages Lutheran Brethren Church. 
But in order to give you sort of a context, I have to take you on a little trip to Norway. And in Norway, we will take a, just a brief look at the church there to find out what kind of uh, background the immigrants who came to Hagen, what they, where they came from. So if we, now that we're in Norway for a little trip, we'll find out that there are basically two churches. First of all, there was a state church and it was Lutheran. And that simply meant that the government took, paid the salaries, the government paid and, and uh, for the building and, and uh, the expenses. And I understand that to a large extent, the government had a bit of in, in involvement in the moving of pastors from one church to another. Now the church was a very formal place and consequently there was a, a lot of legalism and a, a lot of uh, formalism and so basically it turned out that people used the church to be done. That is uh, to be baptized, to be married, and then to be buried. And so there were a fair number of people who were more, much more committed to the Bible and prayer and um, fellowship and so on. So they set it, started their own, what they called a uh, bedehus, which is interpreted as a prayer house. And at these bed, at these prayer houses, basically it was informal, and it was a lot of emphasis on prayer and testimony. And so it's out of that background that most of the people came from Norway to Hagen. And so uh, the immigrants then who coming to Hagen basically came from the Bedehus in Norway. My dad was one of the last ones to come. He arrived when he was about 20 years old, and uh, there were several that had come before him. Anyway, um, then when they came to Hagen, this was early in the, in the development of that part of the world, the part of the country, and consequently, they started attending the ELC Church, Saren Lutheran Church, that was already established there. But what they found was that there was a real difference in terms of the absolution that is given after communion. The uh, ELC, at the ELC Church, what they found was that the pastor after the third communion, he would say, I now give, forgive you all your sins. And of course, the immigrants, they were used to uh, where it was God or that forgave all sins. And consequently, they didn't like this very much. So in about the 1930, 31, somewhere in that year, there was a, a big meeting at the LC church. As a matter of fact, big enough to bring the bishop up. And so one of the immigrants got up and asked the bishop if he would allow the pastor at Saren Church to change the absolution and make it that God is forgiving our sins, or Jesus forgives our sins. And the bishop said no, and added, I think you should start your own church. And so it was from there then that the immigrants sort of got together and they decided that they were going to build a Bedehus up in Hagen. And this was built on my uncle Ole's farm. Uh, I think there was a farmstead there that was 
no longer occupied. And so they just built a little beta house there. And that's where we attended church for quite a number of years. As a matter of fact, I was in the last class to be confirmed there. But uh, we didn't have a pastor. And uh, it was just the lay people that, that did the preaching. But there was a lot of emphasis on the Bible, on prayer. And of course, most of the services were in Norwegian when I was growing up. And so it was uh, very different, but very interesting. But along, the along about that time to see the young people that were growing up in those and from the from the um, immigrants they were going off to lcbi or L slbi as it was called then or to saskatoon or prince albert or someplace to work or go to school and consequently they would run into the problem right away like they had to give they were asked what is your religion or what is your church? And of course, uh, they couldn't very well say the bad who's because that was just a building. And so the immigrants then decided that they needed to <clears throat> probably become affiliated with a synod. And so they started searching and looking and found the one at, uh, at Fergus Falls Minnesota, the Lutheran Brethren Church. Now, ahead of, ahead of the church in Hagen, there was a church in, Vic in um, Frontier. And so there were already was a, a Lutheran Brethren pastor there. And so there was not too difficult to make connections. And we had people come from Frontier, come up to Hagen, and start farming up there. Things were a little bit hard up down on the prairie and in Frontier, and so they came up to Hagen and that's where they started. So, and then of course we became uh, a Lutheran Brethren Church. And a number of summers there in a row, we had somebody come from Fergus Falls up to Hagen and be our pastor for the summer. And uh, he was, uh, I know that a number of times, a man by the name of Professor Christensen, he came up. And uh, he was the one that confirmed me and, and, uh, and whoever else was in my class and so on. And so we had that kind of a connection. Well, then it wasn't too long before it really became obvious that we needed a, a larger church. The group was growing and, and uh, we needed an affiliation with a, a congregation, so they started working on building the church. Now, this Professor Christensen, he had been a carpenter before he started uh, being at the seminary. And consequently, when he came up north, he was very adamant we had to start building a church and and he spent a lot of his day also uh, working on the church as well as having a prayer meeting on Wednesday and the Sunday morning sir, or Sunday afternoon service. So that's kind of where uh, it got started and then um, they uh, started soon got the building in Hagen and that was Bethel, and so that was that was the, the church then. But I'd like to give you about, um, there were about six characteristics of the uh, group at Hagen, just to sort of give you a little more about the background. There was a heavy emphasis on these six things. Number one, the Bible. And of course, like I said, most of it was written or read in Norwegian and people prayed in Norwegian and so on. 
but it was gradually by now getting to be the place where we needed much more in the English language in order to attract people that were not necessarily immigrants. But the Bible was, was a very important factor. Number two, the personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That was talked about a lot. As a matter of fact, as about a, a 10 year old, I can remember many times going to, going to church and somebody would come to me and say, well, how is it with you and Jesus today? There was a lot of concern, a lot of emphasis about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Number three, the power of prayer. Number four, evangelism and missions. Number five, all Christians were to be ministers. And of course, you know, 99% uh, of the people attending the church were farmers. So it would be when they went to town or, or they met somebody or something, then they would try to get on to talking about Jesus Christ and so on. And then number six, it was to be a congregational church. So there was no bishop, no hierarchy kind of thing. We were affiliated eventually with Fergus Falls and the Lutheran Brethren, but the Lutheran Brethren has always insisted that the individual churches are independent. They get involved, the Synod gets involved only when they are invited in to do something or to correct something or for whatever reason. Well, along the same time, of course, the uh, church, there was a church developing in Viscount. And uh, the people that were involved in the one in Viscount were Solids and Hogrids and I think Danielsons a little later on. And, and there were probably a number of other people there as well. <clears throat> And then, of course, the people from Bethel and Hagen and from Bethania in uh, Viscount would get together for special services. There'd be a week of services at either place and the other church was invited to come and join them and so on. Well, of course, this resulted in the fact that Three of the young ladies from Bethel and Hagen married three men from Viscount. And so the two churches got, to, got together a lot more often, and often uh, in the families particularly. Now it happened that one couple stayed in Hagen and two couples stayed in, in, in Viscount. So that's, the, that's just the way it happened. But also along this time, uh, there was a number of people that had already moved to Saskatoon. And so the group there were typically attending the Alliance Church on University Drive, but they also started uh, house meetings on Sunday afternoon, once a month. And at these house meetings, they would be very much like the Bedehus the Bede in Norway or the Bedehus at Hagen and so on. We'd, a small group would get together. Somebody would lead in a bit of a sermon. But there was more emphasis on prayer and testimonies. And so that kind of fulfilled those six that I gave you earlier. So by the time um, in July of uh, 1996 was a real big year for Rock of Ages Church. That was the year that we called Luther and Joanne Larson and their son Daniel. 1966, I think you said 1963. 63, okay. I'm sorry, yeah. 1963. 
And it's interesting, just as a sideline here, that the first Sunday that Helen and I were back from our honeymoon, we went to church, and some of the first people we met were Luther and John Larson, and they had just come. He had just graduated that year, so it was his first church, and so he came and started the church here in Saskatoon. Now, it wasn't called Rock of Ages then because it wasn't organized or anything, but he and a number of us that were involved at that point, we did a lot of surveying in the area of where we actually built the first church on Preston Avenue. But we needed a place to meet before we had our own church, so uh, Luther was able to rent Prince Philip School. And uh, the vice principal at Prince Philip School happened to be me. So every Monday I would get some teacher coming and saying to me, here's some, here's some church bulletins that you left in the, in the room. Uh, do you want them? And I would just sort of take them to be, take care of them. So we rented Prince Philip and we had a Sunday morning service there. And Sunday school, we started the Sunday school very, very soon after we started the church. And uh, it grew and grew slowly and so on. But then uh, we got to the place where Luther also found some property and that was on Preston Avenue. And so that's where they started the church while Luther was here. He was here for five years, about five years. And during that time, we started building the church. Now, I have to remind you that we got a tremendous amount of help from the church in Hagen, Bethel, as well as from the church in Viscount. We got financial help. We got a lot of help in building and, uh, and so on, so that we are indebted to those two churches for the way the first, ch first church was built here in Saskatoon. And of course, they helped and they would buy things and bring them and so on. So, and slowly and slowly, they, many of those families moved to Saskatoon. And then, of course, it was more, very natural for them to uh, attend a Rock of Ages church. So we had a lot of people from Viscount and a lot of people from Hagen moving down to Saskatoon. And most of them would come to Rock of Ages. Well, at, after about five years, then Luther and Joanne and Daniel, and I think they had two or three others then, they got a call to go back to another church in the States. And so within a few months, we had a new pastor by the name of Richard Rognes and his wife, Agnes. Wonderful, very dedicated people and so on. And they had a family of six which uh, boosted our Sunday school significantly. And so Rognes, Pastor Rognes, he stayed also for about five years. And during the time that he was here, that's when we built the parsonage next door to the church. And so Pastor Rognes, I think, was the first pastor to live in the parsonage. So he and his family, they occupied that. And then we had a, a garage built so that they had a garage for their vehicle. And so by the time Rog Pastor Rognes left, which was another five years, then we were at Rock of Ages, fairly well established. By this time, we had organized We'd been accepted by the Synod as a church. Um, the name Rock, uh, Rock of Ages became permanent. 
we got uh, three elders were uh, appointed or it came to be. And of course, the treasurer and a, a lot of others like that. So that by the time Pastor Ragnus left, he, we had a fairly well organized church. And that's where um, I'm going to sort of bring this history to an end. Uh, as most of you probably already know that we made two additions to the church at Preston Avenue before we moved to our present location. But um, the six points that I mentioned earlier, the Bedahoos and the sort of organization of the Bedahoos was very, very important and I believe is still important for our church at Rock of, Rock of Ages. So I hope that gives you a little picture of where our church started, uh, why it is like it is, and for quite a while it has been called to be a Norwegian Lutheran, but, which was partly true, I guess, in its origin, but certainly we moved away from any one nationality, and, and we now have uh, people from a whole variety of nationalities, as you will see if you can come to visit Rock of Ages sometime on Sunday morning. But you, you better phone ahead or wait till the COVID is over, and then you're welcome to come and bring your kids and bring your children and your families and so on, and we'll give you a hearty welcome. And when the COVID is over, we'll even give you free coffee. So thank you for listening, and I hope this makes good sense. May the Lord richly bless you as you take your needs to him and as you um, uh, go to the throne of grace on behalf of the kingdom of God and the advance of the gospel in your great city. The Apostle Paul said at the end of his paragraph about spiritual warfare in Ephesians chapter 6, pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me so that I may fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Prayer is this mystery, this wonderful gift that God has given us, and this calling that God has placed upon our lives. I want to just uh, talk a little bit about uh, a writer that, uh, on the subject of prayer, that was well known in Lutheran Brethren circles. And when I was a ch child, uh, pastors often referred to Ole Hollisby and his writings on prayer. Many other writings too, but his little book on prayer is actually known around the world. I heard uh, Dr. Alexander from Scotland quote from that book when I was at the Urbana Missionary Conference in 1984. But Hollisby, this Norwegian writer, makes some fascinating statements about the subject of prayer. One, he says, is it's not that we move the Holy Spirit by our prayers, but rather that the Holy Spirit moves us to pray. The Spirit of God is living within us, and he is the one that moves us to pray and bring our needs to God and to pray for those around us. Then he defines prayer in a couple of different ways, but one of them that I, I really appreciate is his definition that prayer is letting Jesus into our need. Isn't that incredibly simple? And the text that he uses for that definition is from John chapter 11, the story of the death of Lazarus and the raising of Lazarus. And Jesus and uh, the disciples are not in the vicinity of Bethany. And Mary and Martha send a prayer request to Jesus. Read it sometime. All they say is, Lord, the one you love is sick. Isn't that profoundly simple? Not pleading with him with all kinds of fervor to get him to do something, that they need him to raise their brother up to life and to health again. But simply, this is what our need is. Lord, the one you love is sick. That is so incredibly simple. 
And I can't tell you how many times when I have been anxious, lying awake, usually between three and four in the morning, I just simply say, Jesus, I'm anxious right now. It's letting Jesus into our need. And that is something I would just encourage all of you to incorporate into your own lives as you think about this ministry of prayer. But then I want to share with you just a couple of uh, concepts of the potential that prayer is. And this actually comes from a prayer seminar that we developed back, oh, over 20 years ago. We wanted to um, do some work of evangelism in our denomination in anticipation of the turn of the millennium. And we felt we first needed to have people praying. And so we developed a prayer seminar, seminar to be taught in our churches and then an evangelism seminar. And this is just uh, from the first couple of pages from uh, that. I want to share this document with you. And notice now uh, some of the potential of prayer. Number one, our prayers sustain and govern the whole universe. God created us with dominion to be over the earth. But what happened? The fall came and we lost that dominion. But now we've been redeemed and that dominion is restored, not in the way that Adam would have had it, but now it's restored through the second Adam, through Jesus Christ. He is the one who rules the universe. And how do we then rule? <laughs> By coming to God in Jesus' name, in prayer. Second, through prayer, God's word advances. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the message of the Lord may spread rapidly and be honored just as it was with you. Third, through prayer, God creates opportunities to speak the gospel. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for us too, that God may open the door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains, from Colossians. Through prayer, God makes the message clear. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly, clearly as I should. And isn't that what you want to do in the regions around Rock of Ages? Make the message clear. People of Saskatoon, there is a God in heaven who is merciful to sinners, but you have offended him by your sin. You're lost. You're under his condemnation. But his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, has taken all of your judgment upon himself and died in your place. Now repent and believe the good news that your sins are forgiven. <laughs> That's the message that you want to make clear. And then through prayer, God protects servants. Notice the Apostle Paul's request for protection and for prayer as he writes in the book of Romans at the end of uh, chapter 15. Pray that I may be rescued from the unbelievers in Judea. But then notice that it's through prayer that God fulfills his promises. God's promised protection to Paul when he was converted, I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. That's what he said to Agrippa. But in Acts, in Acts 26, and yet Paul prays, asks the Romans to pray for him, that God would fulfill his promise. And so we pray God's promises back to him. And then finally, and this isn't all of the list, but this is uh, perhaps the significant ones right now, that through prayer, God sends workers into the harvest. I know at some point in time, you'll be praying for a shepherd for your congregation. It is so appropriate to say, Lord Jesus Christ, you are the Lord of the church, and you are the Lord of the harvest. And we pray that you would raise up for our congregation a shepherd and someone to lead to bring your word to us, and then to teach us and guide us as we seek to bring this message to our community. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I just thank you so much for the people of Rock of Ages, uh, for the way the gospel has gone out to hundreds and thousands around uh, uh, that community through this congregation. And I pray now that you 
will uh, guide them as they seek your face. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are indwelling them and that you are the one moving them to pray. And we look to you to, uh, to answer their prayers. Thank you that we can come to the throne of grace in the name of Jesus. And we look forward to the work that you will do through this congregation and the way that you will answer their prayers. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.